bright of them. Try going left, see what happens. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Dr Kat and this is Reading the Past. Now, the start of this video you saw us travelling. I'm now back in our flat, as you can tell from the bookcase behind me. But this is a vlog, I suppose, of my trip with my husband to Stratford-upon-Avon. I want to look at what's on offer in Stratford-upon-Avon for visitors or learners. Is it simply a Disneyland for Shakespeare or is there something more to it? What is there and what can we learn from it? So with that in mind, let's go. The RSC or Royal Shakespeare Company is perhaps the most famous export from Stratford-upon-Avon, excluding William Shakespeare himself. And certainly it was the reason that I was so keen to go up on this occasion. I particularly wanted to see their current production of Tamburlaine, which is of course by Christopher Marlowe, but nevertheless I was really excited to see this quite infrequently performed play. It's a very complex text and it's got some quite difficult and tricksy staging that needs to happen. And if you get the chance to go and see it before their run ends, I highly recommend because they did not disappoint. But their building also houses a museum and it's a museum of theatre history. So if you're interested in costume choices, set design, even the way in which scripts are cut, they've also got a first folio. I highly recommend a look at that because they've done it really beautifully. Perhaps for me, one of the most interesting things about this building is the architect. So the Royal Shakespeare Company's theatre opens in 1932 on the site of the old burned down Memorial Theatre. It is designed by a woman, Elizabeth Scott, in the 1920s, and it makes it the first important building to be built in this country that was designed by a woman. And for me, that makes it particularly beautiful to see and experience and enjoy this space. I was somewhat surprised that when I got to Stratford-upon-Avon that while the RSC is there and being promoted, the real heavy hitter of a Shakespeare offer was the Birthplace Trust. This trust was founded in 1847 by public subscription. By 1891, an Act of Parliament set out to protect the trust for the benefit of the nation. They present themselves as being aimed at a f the full gamut of society. So from a child being introduced to Shakespeare for the first time, all the way up to having something on offer for a doctoral student looking to learn more about Shakespeare. So I figured that as a former doctoral student with a husband who, although not a child, has very limited interest in Shakespeare and not much knowledge of it, this, we'd be fairly good candidates to test out this theory. Now, I don't know, obviously, we don't know, obviously, what it's like to travel there with children, but we can talk about how accessible it is, and hopefully you'll find that stuff useful. The Birthplace Trust looks after a number of properties, one of which we didn't manage to go and see because it was quite far out for us, but that was Mary Arden's Tudor Farm. That's the birthplace and childhood home of Shakespeare's mother. It's also a place that William himself apparently visited in his own childhood. As we didn't go there, I won't be talking about that anymore. 
but I think from Mary Arden's Tudor Farm all the way through, what's quite interesting about the way the birthplace operates is that you can chart Shakespeare's life through the properties. They are there for periods of his life. And on top of that, I think it's possible to, I suppose, remove the Shakespeare element and also explore it as these are properties that are lived in by people of the past and we can understand them better and our history better by looking at them. The birthplace is furnished to appear as it would have done in 1574 when William would have been 10 years old and the eldest surviving child of his parents. He would have been there with his brothers and sisters, Gilbert, Joan, Anne and baby Richard. It's also the site where Shakespeare's Glover father had his workshop and perhaps shop, so that is also represented within the space. They have surviving examples of 16th century furniture resting alongside researched reproductions. It's also possibly the home of a 18-year-old William and his new bride Anne Hathaway straight after their shotgun wedding. It also is inherited by William in 1601 after his father's death. William subsequently leaves this house to his eldest daughter Susanna. Also protected by the birthplace is Anne Hathaway's cottage. This is a 1460s hall, single room, uh, single storey dwelling that expands out as the Hathaway family becomes more affluent yeoman farmers. They were in the wool trade so they did fairly well out of that exceptionally profitable product. The cottage is filled to the brim with lots of period furniture and it's set in an absolutely gorgeous 19th century garden. So you can go from Shakespeare's birthplace to the home of his wife and then from there you can go on to new place. Now that's the footprint of the house is all that stands and in it they have built a beautiful garden with lots of lovely pieces of art and you can also see marked out on the floor the footprint of the building and its rooms as it was discovered when it was excavated. William purchases new place as a family home in 1597. He's 33 years old at this time and from being there you find out just how large this house was. In fact it was the largest house in the borough, probably around about 20 to 30 rooms at the time that William buys it. He is incredibly wealthy and influential within his local community by this point in his life. Of course he is a actor playwright and sharer in the Lord Chamberlain's and later King's Men by this point. When William dies, his eldest daughter, again she seems to certainly be the favourite, inherits the property, although his wife Anne is allowed to live there until her own death in 1616. The final property that sits underneath the Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust banner is the marital home of that favoured elder daughter Susanna and her physician husband John Hall and that is called Hall's Croft. Susanna marries John Hall in 1607 but most of this property they say was built in 1613. For me of particular interest was the references that are made to the medical science of the time of course John Hall being a physician there's lots of medical equipment on display in the house as well as the beautiful examples of furniture and there is also a fantastic physic garden that's being produced outside of which I'm going to speak more about later on in this video. For me it is really helpful to have these properties laid out in the way they are that you can experience a time before Shakespeare and also a time after Shakespeare and I think it's interesting that in this town that is so Shakespeare focused, the Birthplace Trust is willing and able to explore these themes and as far as I'm concerned more power to them for doing so. In addition to the RSC and Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust there are some other places that are certainly worth exploring. The churches and monuments that are in Stratford related to Shakespeare and those that are not. Of particular worthy mention is the Guildhall and Schoolroom. 
This is a two-storey Tudor building. On the lower floor you have the Guild buildings. Now, prior to the Reformation, these were rooms of the Guild of the Holy Cross. They managed to secularise and maintain their role within their civic community and maintain their authority and power. Indeed, at a certain time, Shakespeare's father, John, becomes bailiff of this guild. It operates as a sort of courtroom downstairs. Upstairs is the schoolroom. This is where Shakespeare studied. There is a Tudor schoolroom, but also a Georgian schoolroom at the back. And on the site of the Georgian schoolroom, that is where visiting companies of players would have to perform their works before the members of the guild in order to get the license to perform in Stratford. So in this one building, we have Shakespeare having his learning, we have his capacity to watch his father work in the courts of law, we also have his ability to watch the finest acts of his day perform. Arguably, this building may be quite intrinsic to the shaping of the man Shakespeare. Now, I'm not a fan of biography, but I think if you're going to engage in it, this is a property that you need to come and see. And even if you're not, it's really worth coming to to experience those legal and educational frameworks that are happening during this period. We believe that Shakespeare would have started at this schoolroom in 1571, so he would have been seven, along with all the other boys. He left school early, we think at around 15, so he didn't complete his education. But while he was there, he was under the charge of a couple of schoolmasters. One of them, Thomas Jenkins, is played by a costumed historical interpreter. And Thomas Jenkins was particularly keen on getting his boys to perform. So again, we have the legal activities happening downstairs. We have the performances of these fine actors for their licensing. We also have Shakespeare himself learning not only to read and write and learn these fascinating stories, many of which he then adapts, we also have him being asked to perform. So again, this is a space that's really worth looking at if you want to try to figure out how Shakespeare becomes Shakespeare. Another site we visited was Tudor World. And as you're gonna see from the following video clip, I wasn't sure about going into this building and Jamie, my husband, was very keen on taking me in there and took extreme glee in my discomfort. So I'm gonna show you that now. Because I love my husband very much and I have dragged him around many, many sites, both here and in the past, we are now gonna go and have a look around the Tudor World Museum. <laughs> now, it is supposed to be done in a horrible histories way. Now, one thing I was about horrible histories is that while it's not perfect, there is an attention to detail or an attempt at attention to detail um, with some elements of dumbing down. So that's sort of what I'm expecting to see here. Let's see if that's what happens. I love that you're laughing. <laughs> Stop trolling me. Do you know what I mean? For me, Tudor World is confusing because they market themselves as a almost pantomimic, bodice rippery, London Dungeons-esque experience. I had fears that I was going to see essentially fake history up and down the place, that there was going to be no research, it was going to be the Henry VIII has syphilis story played out over and over again. And that isn't what it was. They claim in small print that they are a Horrible Histories version. And while Horrible Histories, as I say, is not perfect, it is researched, dumbed down, certainly, but they are paying attention to the details of history. And that is what's happening here. Did I enjoy myself? Yes, it was great fun. My husband enjoyed himself too. I think kids would love it. You get to sit on the beds, you get to play with objects, you get to fiddle about with stuff, and it's great for that. While it's not somewhere that I would say, this is a must, if you've only got a day in Stratford, make sure you make it here, I wouldn't say that, but if you're there for a few days and you've got an afternoon spare, it's certainly a really good time. And if you're a history geek like myself, you won't be annoyed by what they're saying. I've thought a lot about how I wanted to present what I found in Stratford, and to me it seems the clearest way of doing it is sort of thematically. 
And the themes I want to look at is outside and inside, so homes and gardens, and then also body and soul. As you wander around Stratford-upon-Avon, you check out the Birthplace Trust. And so you can go into the garden of the birthplace. And here you can see what it is here is it's a 19th century garden. What's missing is the garden of Shakespeare and his family wouldn't have known it. The outbuildings, the stables, the physic garden, the vegetable patches. And in the rear corner, a stage has been erected. And on this stage, actors perform script from Shakespeare's play. When we were there, um, somebody was doing the St Crispin's Day speech from Henry V. You can then wander through and go to Anne Hathaway's cottage, which is a mile out of Stratford. It's a lovely walk through lots of little back alleyways. And you actually get to walk through the front door as the Anne Hathaway's family would have used it. So this is perhaps the door that Shakespeare used when he came a courting. It's really nice to experience that, to follow in Shakespeare's footsteps. You can walk inside these properties and walk through the living spaces. And kitchens and bedrooms. And it, so you've got the bed and then beneath it you've got the truckle which would come out for uh, maybe a maid servant or possibly some children. A lovely little cot here. Um, now, in obviously this is Shakespeare's daughter's house, but they, they say that a bed frame would potentially be in a kind of home of the middling sort would be a third of the value of the household goods. And people would be born in beds they would then inherit, they would then marry and have their own children in, they would potentially die in. So beds are not disposable, like the mattresses might get changed out, but the bed frame itself goes generation, it's with somebody throughout their whole life sometimes. Closed privy stool here. Um, you've got a little, they've set up a little wash station, so you could wash maybe your neck and face with some muslin. Obviously you're not gonna get in the bath because hot water opens the pores and lets the miasma in. So we've come upstairs and we've got another example of a bed with a little truckle underneath which with what looks like a kind of plaited straw mattress and then we've got a teeny tiny short chair but I'm not quite sure what it's for. Um, Oompa Loompas. Perhaps it's for, yes, early modern Oompa Loompas. That's, that's your suggestion. <laughs> What's cool is through here, they've actually, um, they've glassed off a section of the um, wall so you can sort of see how it's structured underneath the wattle and daub. Then as now, the aspiration was to have a home with a garden. As you saw just a moment ago, the birthplace garden is from the 19th century. There's also a beautiful garden at Anne Hathaway's cottage that also dates from the 19th century. New Place is itself a garden, so you have the patioed off area at the front, which has got the footprint of the house, but then out the back they have a reconstructed Tudor knot garden. And I have some footage of us playing in that. Here we go. <laughs> He's playing Batman in the knot garden. Um, the way we understand these very ordered, organised spaces now is that they are an attempt for Tudor people to show that they have mastery over the natural world. And one can only assume that in a world where sickness is prevalent and frequently unexplained, that some sort of ordering or capacity to order the natural world would feel quite comforting this level of kind of design control would be pretty appealing I would imagine for people who were unsure of what the future held. Look at him pac-manning it up. Is that a nice time? Yeah. 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 Are you being pac-man? Yeah. Good. Are 
You done being Pac-Man now? Yeah, yeah okay. sure. Yeah. Talking about that. For us, though, the most exceptional garden that we visited was the one at Hallscroft. And here's why. So we've just been talking to the gardener here at Hallscroft and we think he's the head gardener for the whole of the Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust but he is so incredibly not knowledgeable about um, particularly like the physic gardens we've just been talking about physic gardens with him for like quarter of an hour and it was super interesting and he was really kind and prepared to share his knowledge and it's an absolute gift I think when any kind of historical institution has somebody like that who is just prepared to down tools and just talk to people and be fun with it it's just an absolute blessing what do you think well it's amazing incredibly knowledgeable and um patient to answer all the questions and yeah lots of practical knowledge about not just uh what you learn in a book but actually what you learn from working in the garden yeah it's and it's i think that's the thing when when people are kind of when people decry stuff like his, um, experimental archaeology and they don't see it as real history there is something about putting the clothes on your back putting your hands in the dirt and dealing with this stuff that gives you a knowledge that no amount of book learning or um, online archival research is going to give you it just isn't you there is something that he understands fundamentally that unless somebody like me was actually digging in the ground we just simply wouldn't understand um, and it's been an absolute gift to meet him and I think he's they're very 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 lucky to have him here are you going to take up horticulture now? I don't think I'm going to take up horticulture because I'm incredibly clumsy and I think <laughs> that me with a large pair of shears is, 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 um, is bad news but I tell you what you, you start and I'll observe down the front here, what I'm, what's, you can see through the camera now, is this is all vegetables at the front closest to us. So there's two vegetable patches and then further back where there's that sort of little pathway, that's the physic garden. And he's actually reclassified it based on the humours each area is supposed, to, is supposed to treat. So it's divided into four sections. So it would be about blood, black bile, um, yellow bile and phlegm. Uh, so yeah, he's he's redivided it up so the right plants are in the right space, and he's going to do even more work to segment it up more and more. Um, it's going to be amazing, and um, yeah, it's in the back garden of this amazing house that was lived in by Susanna, Shakespeare's daughter, and her husband, a physician. Um, what a place! I have a confession to make. I love physic gardens and the reason for that is because to me they are evidence of a lost knowledge. Virtually every housewife in the nation in the early modern and medieval period would have had a knowledge of plants and herbals that is so completely lost to us now. They would have had an idea of how to bring down a fever, how to treat a rash, how to deal with a headache just from the plants that were in their garden if they were lucky enough to have one but also from plants they could have found in hedgerows or public land this is knowledge that while it might have been based on something as i talk about in my humoral sciences video that was incorrect the plants still work and i think it's worth mentioning that our medicine is still based on plants the best painkiller that we still use now although it's in different forms it's been made into tablets and liquids and it's been medicalized but its root source is still the opium plant however it's been taken out of our hands we don't have unless you're a particular type of person we don't have opium poppies growing in our back gardens we don't have echinacea we go to a holland and barrack other stores are available or we go and see our doctor for a prescription and that is how we are medicating ourselves but we don't have the knowledge that they had so within Hall's Croft it's absolutely possible that the physician John Hall is using these plants in his own garden to treat his patients but it's also possible that his wife Susanna Shakespeare's daughter would have been treating her own family so John and perhaps people in her village, perhaps her parents, she would have been treating her family with the medicines from her own physic garden. 
And that to me is really interesting that it's not necessarily John the physician that's using this within his household. It may and probably was his wife. The household manual was aimed at women. It's talking about these physic gardens. Nevertheless, within Hallscroft, and now I want to kind of talk more about the theme of the body, within Hallscroft, there is a lot of medical equipment on display. Let's have a look at it. So we've got cataract surgery, take the, move the cataract. We've got a muscle knife, a syringe at number four, a um, amputation sort. So going for going through bone. We've got a prosthetic nose that covers up either maybe bone from the wall or syphilis. We've got a trepan for drilling to the skull, you know, letting out those evil spirits. Most of the people actually survived that procedure because of the bone evidence. And then we have a fleam for bleeding. For health purposes, not for, you know, Stu's bodily harm. Unfortunately, on the day that we went to Horscroft, we missed the leech expert. And she's actually licensed to keep medical leeches. And I think she apparently brings them with her to Horscroft. So if you get the chance to go and visit and she's there, make use of that amazing fund of knowledge. When we think about the body, I think we also think about how we costume it. And across the birthplace, there's lots of examples of costume that you can look at and also force your husband to wear because you're bullying him a little bit. Let's have a look at that. <laughs> Do you want to put the cape on? No. <laughs> you look majestic. You look majestic. Look at yourself in the mirror. You look absolutely gorgeous. I look. I mean, you look a little bit like a dog who might, you know, try and chew his stitches out. <laughs> and so I've managed to get him in a little bonnet. I think you look lovely. What did I ever do to you? <laughs> you found the birch. <laughs> <laughs> you look like a very happy teacher. But if you really want to look at the history of costume, then you have to take a trip to the RSC Museum. There they have on display the finest examples from their costume archive, but they also have this great thing, which is an augmented reality, whereby you can sort of try on the costumes. They're really pumping out this modern way of representing a museum. And I think it's brilliant. If you're interested in heritage and the displays of history, if you want to look at how it's done, visiting these various different sites from Tudor World to the various houses held by the birthplace to the RSC Museum, um, all the way through to the Guildhall and schoolroom, you're seeing very different ways in which heritage is being presented and very successful ways despite those differences, I really recommend checking all of them out. Of course, for our early modern predecessors, the body was simply the vessel for the soul. And Shakespeare grew up and lived through a time of spiritual upheaval. And that is something that I think is particularly interesting within Stratford-upon-Avon, because there are displays where you can scratch the surface of Shakespeare and see these wider, Reformation and post-Reformation contexts. First of all on your hit list might be Holy Trinity Church. This is the site in which William Shakespeare was both baptised and buried. We have the baptismal font and we also have his grave site. He is buried alongside his wife, his daughter and her husband and also his granddaughter's first husband absolutely worth seeing and visiting is the Guild Chapel because in the Guild Chapel you have this spectacular example of a doom painting. This is reminding parishioners of the final judgment. This is 
medieval church art and it was whitewashed under the orders of successive monarchs through the Reformation period. For it to survive is fascinating and for us to have access to it in this level of quality is absolutely brilliant. Also within this chapel is this picture called Earth Upon Earth. It is spectacular in the way it has survived. It is essentially a memento mori. It's reminding worshippers that they too will die, that their body is simply a vessel and that their immortal soul is what they should be concerned with. All of this gets stripped away through the Reformation. It's very difficult for me to think of an example, a modern example, of what it would have felt like to have these buildings whitewashed. The closest I can come, and it's even then a fairly poor representation, is perhaps if we imagine that every television screen, every cinema screen, every poster or billboard, rather than being in colour, suddenly becomes black and white. Maybe that's the closest we can get to understanding, or perhaps all of those images get pulled out of our lives. If these images have whetted your appetite, then a trip again, as I mentioned, to the schoolroom and Guildhall is really worth your time because downstairs, where the court space would have been, where John Shakespeare would have stood his tenure as bailiff, at the back they have uncovered an altar painting and even more recently, they found this beautiful survivor, the face of John the Baptist. This was covered up when the Guild of Holy Cross had to secularise, but here it is, uncovered for us to enjoy now. There's also elements of a more superstitious faith practice. At Anne Hathaway's cottage, we found a witch mark. Now, I couldn't film it because it was simply too dark, but carved into the fireplace above the parlour is this fish. It's a religious symbol meant to ward off evil spirits. It's right by the chimney, as they often were, because spirits were thought to be able to enter through the chimney. Also on display at Anne Hathaway's cottage is this anti-evil device. It's called a Bartman jug or a bearded man jug and as that's probably because of the little face with the beard on it. And you would stuff this full of herbs and plants and urine. Urine is fabulous for keeping away evil spirits and demons. And it would sit alongside things like witch marks and herbs around the door to protect and preserve the home. Now, of course, there are plenty of people that have their home blessed by priests today that might call somebody in to sage if they think they're haunted. Plenty of people wear evil eyes or put evil eyes on their wall. So it's not that uncommon, but I think these are beautiful surviving examples that you can experience on your visit to Stratford. There are certainly times when Stratford-upon-Avon feels like Shakespearean Disneyland. They really want you to know that Shakespeare was born here, that Shakespeare came from here. And I understand why. When you've got a fabulous heritage export, you're going to sell it. But, and this is the big thing, Shakespeare is just the surface. And when you scratch beneath it, whether you're at the RSC or the Birthplace Trust or the schoolroom, when you speak to the room stewards or the costumed interpreters or the people in the bookshops, you find that there is a wealth of knowledge and a passion for history, literary culture, theatre history that is unparalleled. The people there really care about their heritage and the national culture. And it's really worth asking some questions because they are helpful and welcoming. I didn't find anybody who was keen to fob me off. Everybody wanted to have a chat about something that was Shakespeare related, but also stuff that wasn't Shakespeare related. It's brilliant to see this and it's brilliant to experience it. And I absolutely loved it. So I suppose what I want to say is Stratford Raven, you know, come for the Shakespeare experience the Marlowe, go to the RSC and see Tamburlaine, but stay, scratch the surface, dig a little deeper, find out about how those who lived at the same time as Shakespeare and before and after him lived. 
how they organised their homes, how they shaped their garden and their natural world. Learn about their bodies, how they costumed them, but also how they attempted to protect and preserve their souls in increasingly dangerous and uncertain spiritual times. Of course, uh, no vlog video is complete without some additional funny excerpts. So if you stayed this long, please keep watching because uh, here's some other funny things that we found. So if you've made it to the end of this video, thank you. And as a reward, let's have some hilarity. You may have noticed that you've been slightly positioned differently and I'm joined by some friends. Because when we go away, we do love to take a trip down to the shops and get some souvenirs. And when you're talking about souvenirs in Stratford-upon-Avon, you are going to be hard pressed to avoid a rubber duck. They love a rubber duck. So I've got Anne Boleyn duck. I've got Henry VIII duck. I've got Elizabeth I duck. I've got, obviously, a William Shakespeare duck, which adorably has a little uh, bit of paper that says to quack or not to quack love. Um, we went to a cafe called the Forties, which is unsurprisingly Forties themed. Amazing afternoon tea. If you're going, check it out. And there we got Rose the River to Duck and we got Spitfire Pilot Duck. We also, of course, had to come home with William Shakespeare. I love him. Look at him in his little... Shakespeare outfit with his little collar. Isn't he sweet? Uh, we also found some other weird and wonderful things and this is uh, what we learnt about them. Check out this. Of all the things I never knew I needed but desperately want, quite clearly, the William Shakespeare action figure with removable quill pen and book. I mean, where has this been all my life? Why didn't, why didn't I know about this? This is absolutely spectacular. Thank you, Shakespeare's birthplace, for showing me that such a wonderful thing exists. I'm, I'm sold, absolutely. So we've um, just we're just heading in from the exhibition site. We're gonna go and have a look around the birth's place. But um, you had a lot of issues with that last uh, thing, the bollock dagger. What was that about? They're making it up. <laughs> Who would actually call a weapon a bollock dagger? That's bollocks. <laughs> They're just trying to see what they can get past us. It's, it's nonsense. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I don't know why they'd make it up. It's a great practical joke. Okay, okay, I tell you what, um, the... <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Okay, I tell you what, if you can, Bollock dagger. If you can prove to me that it's, that it's been made up, if it's some elaborate hoax, um, I'll, I don't know, I'll give it's you a tenner. It's the easiest one in Anne's bollock on. <laughs> You've sworn a lot. I think he's bollock done. Dagger. He's done with that. We're going to go and have a look at the birthplace. <laughs> Also, my husband convinced me, with a crippling fear of heights, to get on a Ferris wheel. Oh, check you out, Gerald. Oh my god, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this! Ignore that face. The view was delightful, despite the fact that I could hear my heartbeat in my ears. Thank you, Stratford-upon-Avon. You were wonderful and I can't wait to visit you again. If you enjoyed this video, and I hope you did, please give it a like, subscribe, and click the bell icon so you know when I'm next uploading. If you want to, you can find me over on social media, on Instagram and Twitter. Follow me there, and let's get into a conversation. Are you planning to go to Stratford-upon-Avon? What do you think you'd like to go and see? What do you think of the things that I've seen there? I hope you've enjoyed this and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Take care. Bye bye for now.